Welcome to Nail Reglai Jewish Ministries, where we teach the Bible from a Jewish historical, cultural, and linguistic perspective. This teaching is part three in the Biblical Calendar Teaching Series, and I've titled this teaching, Applying the Biblical Calendar. I want to begin with a definition of the Biblical Calendar. The, the phrase, the Biblical Calendar, is not in the Bible directly, right? So what is the Biblical Calendar? This is a phrase I use and others use to explain um, what we see in the Bible, right? So here is a working definition. The biblical calendar is a framework of days, weeks, months, and years that is detailed in the Bible, which is practical and prophetic, right? So this is my understanding of the biblical calendar. It's what we, where we're taking out what we see in the Bible and making use of it. So what does the Bible actually teach us about the biblical calendar? calendar, and I want to begin with a review of some of the things that we have um, covered in the past couple of teachings. So, in the beginning, in Genesis 1, 14 and 19, we read how God created the sun, moon, and stars for signs, seasons, days, and years. But he, didn't, he did not give us a, um, a thorough uh, instruction manual of how to put all these things together. We sort of had to understand how to um, understand the, the solar system that he has given us to, to count the days, weeks, months, and years. Now, God did say there are seven days in a week, and he, um, he patterned that for us, right, in, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. But how many days are in a month, and how many days are in a year? How many months are in a year? These things weren't explicitly um, spoken of in the book of Genesis and going on. So outside of that, the solar and lunar framework of time um, in the system that God's given us, um, he did not provide details as to how to count the months and years in the book of uh, Genesis. Now in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read how the Lord set apart the month of Passover as the first month of the year. And this month is also called Aviv, Aviv, as we see in Exodus chapter 13. And then later on, we know that there are other names um, given for um, the first month um, and the other months of the year, the Babylonian names. Now, originally, though, God only gave numbers um, for the days of the week and the months of the year outside of that first month, Passover, or the month of Aviv, right? So um, even up to today in Hebrew, we use the numbers for the days of the week and the months of the year, Yom Rishon, Yom Shani, the first day, the second day, right? And these are actually a purer way to understand the days of the week and the months of the year, um, because as we, as we see in the Gregorian calendar, um, it's filled with a lot of pagan names. Now, as we go through the Bible, we see how the Lord continued to define the biblical calendar um, to the Israelites by assigning appointed times, right? These specific days and weeks and months and years, um, as we see mostly in Leviticus 23. It's a good summary of the appointed times. When I say years, I'm talking about the sabbatical year and the year of Jubilee, right? Um, now, the appointed times of the Lord, as uh, outlined in Leviticus 23, are the following. We went uh, in, we, we covered these in the past uh, teachings, but uh, just to uh, mention again that the Sabbath day um, is that day of rest within a seven day week, which is the first of the appointed times. And it's first for um, a couple of different reasons. Number one is first historically, right? It's at, it's during creation week and God sanctified the seventh day, right? And set apart the Sabbath day. Um, it's, it's also different from the other appointed times because the Sabbath day is a weekly event, whereas the other six appointed times are yearly markers on the calendar, right? Just once a year. The Sabbath is also important because it's foundational. The Sabbath um, is an example of a holy day, a day of rest where we don't do anything else, right? We set aside everything else um, to the side and we, we worship God. We, we have a day of rest. We have uh, enjoyment with other people. Um, and that's the pattern as well for the other um, six appointed times. Like, for example, on, 
for Passover, you have the first day and the seventh day of the seven-day feast, which are Sabbath days or the rest days, right? And God consecrated them so that we would have these um, times set apart to enjoy them and to worship Him. And we also see how the other six appointed times are divided into two seasons, the spring appointed times and the fall appointed times, right? Or the spring feast and the fall feast. And um, we see how they are evenly distributed uh, in both the spring and fall seasons. Now, God did not arbitrarily uh, do this, but it is a um, a perfect um, kind of calendar for the the agricultural system in the land of Israel, right? The agricultural year um, in the land of Israel from the first month, that month of Passover, which is also called Nisan later, and this is equivalent to March or April in the spring, to the seventh month, um, which um, the Festival of Tabernacles or Sukkot marks it, um, and that seventh month is called later Tishri, and that's in the time of September, October. And this is defining the the agricultural cycle in Israel, the beginning of the harvest to the end of the harvest. And this is something that God gave, particularly in this land, to the people of Israel to keep this agricultural cycle and to have those periodic times of uh, worshiping God in the land of Israel. Now, the appointed times were also given to foreshadow prophetic events to come. And we saw this in the past teaching how there is perfect fulfillment of this spring appointed times at Messiah's first coming. This was not coincidence. God foreshadowed this. He 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 planned this right. And the the appointed times point exactly to who the Messiah is and uh, outline his um, his becoming the Passover Lamb, sacrifice being sacrificed, dying, um, buried, raised again. And um, and then giving of the Holy Spirit, and it's all marked on God's um, God's calendar, on God's appointed times. And we understand that just as the life of Messiah was fulfilled in the um, spring appointed times, in the in the um, in those uh, spring feasts um, at his first coming, we also believe that the fall appointed times in the seventh month will mark the Messiah's second coming. And that is heralded by the, the uh, trumpet, right? The, um, the, the day of trumpets or the feast of trumpets. And um, this is not something we can say with 100% certainty, but it makes a lot of sense. We see how the spring appointed times were fulfilled in Messiah's first coming, and um, the fall appointed times have yet to be fulfilled, and they fit perfectly what, with what we see prophesied about Messiah's return as we um, looked at in the last teaching. So the prophetic foreshadowing of the two comings of the Messiah are woven into the months of the year on the biblical calendar as we have it outlined for us, especially in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, we asked this question in the past teaching, how many months are there in the year? And there's no real direct biblical answer to this question. Um, again, what is another question, in which months of the year does the biblical calendar begin and end? We know that God said, Passover shall be the first month of the year to you, right? That month of Aviv, later called Nisan. And we do see... Um, 12 months um, mentioned in the scriptures. And we looked at a couple of verses last time, including in Esther. Um, But when does the year actually end? Although God designated Passover as the first uh, month of the year, we read in the scriptures how he designated the year's end in the seventh month, as we read in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16. And I have this, that phrase, taken out and quoted here on the screen, um, which says, the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year. And literally in Hebrew, that's batset hashana, at the going out of the year, at the end of the year. And we know that the feast of ingathering is referring to the feast of um, tabernacles. And um, and this is, we, we understand this as ending the agricultural year, um, in the land of Israel. However, it goes beyond the agricultural year, as we also see in the scriptures. We looked at these last week, but let's just review them again, because the sabbatical year, which is um, taught in the scriptures, begins and ends 
in the seventh month, as we see in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 10. There's also many other scriptures that speak of this sabbatical year, this release of debts, this year that, there, that where there is freedom from slavery and there's Sabbath rest for the land, right? And that year of sabbatical, the sabbatical year begins and ends in the seventh month, the Feast of Tabernacles, that, that unique seventh month. Uh, we also see how the year of Jubilee um, begins and ends in the seventh month, as we see in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 to 12. Again, this year of Jubilee is a year of liberty. Um, it's, it's a year of release from slavery and a return of property, right? Um, and it's counted in the seventh month. So that seventh month is um, the beginning and end of that year. So we see how there are two yearly markers for the start and end of the year in the scriptures. We have the first month, with it, which God clearly said is the beginning, and we have the seventh month where God clearly says there's an end there, and we see how there, there are certain um, years which are marked by that seventh month, the beginning and end in that seventh month. So very uniquely, the scriptures point to these two um, two months, the first month and the seventh month as yearly markers. And just to explain that in Judaism, there are two calendars in the Jewish culture. We have a ceremonial calendar or religious calendar where the months of the year are counted from, which is just as the Bible says from the, that first month of Passover or Nisan, which we call it today. Um, and then we also have the civil calendar, which counts years based on the seventh month. Now, just to mention that on the civil calendar, um, the months are still counted in the same um, number, right? We start with Nisan, the seventh month is Tishrei, um, but that seventh month is set apart for um, counting years. So it's based on this pr uh, biblical principle of a year also beginning and ending in the seventh month that the Feast of Trumpets is celebrated as a traditional Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, right? It's the first day of the seventh month. And this is considered to be the new year on the, the Jewish calendar. And so we see how um, this is a Jewish tradition, but it's actually based on a biblical principle, right? Of There is a yearly cycle that is uh, started and ending in the seventh month. So I know that the biblical concept of two quote-unquote new years seems strange. However, it is actually more common than one may think. And I want to just illustrate this with um, some interesting um, art, art, uh, archaeological and historical um, findings that uh, I have read in preparation for, for this teaching. Now, we see in history how the Babylonian calendar confirms the Jewish understanding of the biblical calendar, including the two New Year markers. So, from studying ancient cuneiform scripts, Dr. William Moose Arnold explains the structure of the Babylonian calendar. So he's going to start here just explaining the Babylonian calendar, and then we'll get in more to this understanding of um, the New Year's, right? So number, so the first quote here, uh, he says, uh, the Babylonian year seems to have consisted of 12 lunar months of 30 days each, intercalary months being added by the priests when necessary. Now, I read his full article just to kind of explain what he's talking about. So he's saying that the Babylonian year consisted of these, um, these 12, 30 day, um, 12 months of 30 days each, which makes for 360 regular days, and a leap month was added every six years to give them a um, 365 um, days per year on their calendar. And, um, and actually, this is where we uh, see how history shows us the concept of a 12-month lunar calendar being codified by the Babylonians as evidenced in their calendar, right? So even though they would have the additional leap month, just like the Hebrew calendar does today, so it may have sometimes 13, the, the, um, the basic calendar had 12 months in the year. Um, and then adding as needed. Now, Dr. Moose Arnold also explains the structure of the Babylonian year. And we read, quote, The Babylonian year began in historical times in the spring. The year is divided into the beginning of the year, the middle, and the end of the year. 
And so very um, clearly we see here how they have this marker in the middle. He then defines the year from the middle. The, the second half year began with the month Tishri Tum, which is the seventh month. And in Hebrew Mishnaic, this is Tishri. And this verb is properly the infinitive PL of the verb suru, meaning begin or to dedicate, right? So again, we see how this seventh month is used as a beginning month. And Dr. William Moose Arnold then adds, quote, according to Dillich, it means beginning of the second half year or the civil year. So this concept of two beginnings to the year, one in the spring and one in the fall, although first appearing in the Bible, is confirmed in the Babylonian calendar. Right? This is historical. We have evidence of this with these cuneiform writings. The Assyrians also had two New Year observations on their yearly calendar in the first and seventh months in Nisan and Tishri. So the biblical concept of yearly markers in the first and seventh months is confirmed in Hebrew, Babylonian, and in Assyrian cultures and history. Now, I think it's amazing to see the confirmation uh, of what we see in the Bible of the first and seventh months being uh, these yearly markers. Um, but more than likely, the Babylonians and Assyrians got it from the, um, the Jews, right? Because God gave that to them. So either way, I think it's just great to see this uh, confirmation of a consistent um, uh, markers of two yearly markers, right? The first and seventh months. Now, this is very similar to what we see in, in modern day society. Um, we, we have both a fiscal financial year beginning in January in many cultures around the world and the academic year beginning in September, right? So in, in many um, nations around the world, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, you have the academic year beginning in September, maybe August or September and going to May or June. And um, this is not in contradiction to the regular Gregorian uh, fiscal year beginning in January and ending in December, right? They, they run in parallel. But uh, it's just the same concept of having kind of two parallel um, ways of counting the years, right? Or two different ways of uh, two different systems, uh, but in the same yearly cycle. So the biblical calendar given at Mount Sinai in 1450 BC has two yearly markers, the first month and the seventh month. And the Babylonian and Assyrian calendars confirm this. Now, as we saw, there's a practical understanding to the biblical calendar as it, as it is in connection or in step with the agricultural season in Israel, right? We have the early harvest in the spring in let's say April and then we have the you know the late harvest or the last harvest in the fall in September and October so this is the beginning and end of the harvest season and we also have the prophetic foreshadowing of the messiah we have messiah's first coming which was fulfilled in those spring um, appointed times right beginning in Nisan and we have messiah's second coming which is foreshadowed in that second part, uh, that second yearly marker in the seventh month, Tishrei, right? At the blowing of the trumpet when the Messiah returns. So apart from prophetically foreshadowing the two comings of the Messiah, how is it beneficial for us today to know and understand the biblical calendar? And that's why we're having this teaching to, to have a practical application, right? What is the real everyday practicality um, of the biblical calendar? So, number one, by understanding the biblical calendar, we can more accurately understand the context of the Bible. Daily Bible study, it's very practical. As we open the book of the, uh, the books of the Bible, we can understand what is being written. So, for example, um, in the book of Exodus, right, in Exodus chapter 40, we read the following verse. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Right, so the biblical calendar provides the dating for when the tabernacle 
was first assembled. It's not January 1st, right? It's not the first month of the first, um, first day of the first month on the Gregorian calendar, right? This is the biblical calendar. And we know that the tabernacle was established on the first day of the first month, meaning that month of what we call now Nisan, which is in March or April. And so we can clearly understand when this took place in history. So it's just good and practical to understand the biblical calendar as God has described it in the scriptures. And just to say that you can easily look online um, for the the Hebrew months um, and even correlating with the Gregorian calendar. So here we see how the number of the months is on the left, followed by the Hebrew month names and the Gregorian calendar equivalent months, right? And because the Hebrew months are lunar, they're always going to um, they're going to fluctuate year to year. And um, but they generally fall within those those two months on the Gregorian calendar. It's just as good to understand that, so that when we read the Bible, we can understand, you know, what season of the year was it? What what certain appointed time was it when these things were going on? Now, knowing the biblical calendar can also help us understand the context of the New Testament. It's not just the Old Testament that uses this biblical calendar concept. Although written in the Greek language during Roman rule in the first century AD, the context of the New Testament focuses mostly on the Jewish people living out the appointed times on the biblical calendar. And so it's very helpful in reading the New Testament. So from the book of Acts, we read the following verse. And there's a hundred verses like this, right? So in Acts 20, 16, For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia. For he was harrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So we know this day of Pentecost Um, corresponds to the Feast of Weeks on the biblical calendar, which we know takes place 50 days after the week of Passover, which would be in May or June. So again, as we're reading through the Bible, it's just good to put everything in perspective, put it in context, and we have that framework of the biblical calendar. So in conclusion to this teaching, we will make a practical application of the biblical calendar to a supposed unresolved conflict in the New Testament. So we're going to get into some uh, deep biblical resolution here, um, and we're going to be using the biblical calendar to help us to help give us understanding. And we're going to see how that that lunar based calendar, which God um, you know explains through. Leviticus 23 will help give us insight as we see this um, this unresolved conflict in the New Testament. Now, one of the main reasons for implementing the Gregorian calendar, as I mentioned in the previous uh, teachings um, back in 1582, um, was number one, to have a more accurate calendar, but it was also to uh, have a more precise dating of the yearly Christian celebration of quote-unquote Easter, right? Resurrection Day, which is based on the date of Passover. You have to understand when Passover is in order to have the corresponding uh, Resurrection Day, right? But there are, are several problems that Gentile Christian scholars have in dating Passover, and I've listed three of them here. Number one, the um, the biblical calendar, which contains Passover, is a lunar calendar, right? It's based on the lunar months, whereas the Gregorian calendar is solar. So how do you mesh those two? That's number one. Number two, the biblical and Jewish concept of a day is from evening to evening, whereas the um, Gregorian concept of a day is generally, right, from midnight to midnight. Um, that's when a new day begins, right? Now, number three is the contradiction of the day of Passover in the four Gospels. And we're going to be focusing on this last point to help bring this all together. I'm going to be explaining this contradiction of the day of Passover in the four Gospels. So, the contradiction in the four Gospels is that the synoptic Gospels, synoptic meaning the same or similar, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're all, they all contain very much uh, the same information, especially about this issue of um, the Passover. So they all speak of Yeshua being crucified on the day 
after Passover, right? Or the day after the, the Passover Seder when they had the Last Supper together. While John speaks of Yeshua being crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover. So, um, now I'm not sure if you've heard of this contradiction or not, but it, in theological circles amongst Bible teachers, pastors, this is well known. So, the question arises, when was Yeshua actually crucified? Was it on the preparation day for Passover, as written in John, or on the day after Passover, or on that first day of, of unleavened bread, which is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? So, there seems to be a, a great contradiction between uh, John and the other three Gospels. We'll be looking um, at the text as well to help give perspective here. So in the Gospel of Luke, we're not going to read Matthew and Mark. They say very similar things. You can read them on your own. But it says this in Luke 22. Then came the first day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Yeshua sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, so that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And then later we read, And they left and found everything, just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Right, And then you have the Lord's Supper when they, when they ate that Passover meal together. Now, according to the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the disciples prepared the Passover for them to eat together when the lambs were being sacrificed, and then they ate the Passover together together that evening. And we call this the Last Supper, right? So, on the 14th of Nisan, at the end of that day, let's say between 3 and 6 p.m., we have the Passover lambs being killed, and they're roasted on the fire. And then as you go into the evening, that's the 15th, Nisan the 15th, and um, that's considered the first day of unleavened bread. Um, and this is when the Passover lambs are eaten, and as well as the matzah bread. And that's the Last Supper, right? And so that's how we see it explained in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now we read in the Gospel of John, in reference to the Last Supper, in the very first phrase here, right? It says, now before the feast of the Passover. And this is talking about the time when Yeshua had the Passover with his disciples. When you, knowing, Yeshua, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end during supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a, cat, a towel, he girded himself. Right? So that's John 13, 1 to 4. So according to Christian scholars, John dates the events of the Passover as we see here written. On the 13th of Nisan, we have the Last Supper, which would be the day before Passover. And then on the 14th of Nisan, Yeshua is arrested and crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover. And we see evidence of this later in the Gospel of John, as we read here in John chapter 19, which says, Therefore, when Pilate when Pilate heard these words, he brought Yeshua out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king, but Caesar. So here very clearly on the day Yeshua was crucified, we read, now it was a day of preparation for the Passover. How can this be? From the accounts in the four Gospels, there appears to be a contradiction of when these events took place. John's Gospel says that Yeshua was crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say that Yeshua was crucified on the day after the Passover, right? Or that first day of unleavened bread. So when was Yeshua crucified? On the preparation day for Passover or on the day after Passover? Or on that first day, we would say, of Passover. So is there a contradiction? Christian theologians have struggled to understand this supposed contradiction and have yet to discover a reasonable solution.
Now, I'm going to read a quote here from a book, uh, which is The Harmony of the Gospels. And um, just to give an example of this ongoing uh, unresolved conflict in the Gospels. We read this, quote, Different attempts have been made to resolve this apparent contradiction. Some have proposed that the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are right, and John is wrong, while others have suggested the opposite. Another proposal has been to say both versions are correct and to strain the interpretation of one or the other account to make it match up with its opposite. So what are they saying? Translation, there is no solution, therefore scholars try to force an interpretation, right? They, they have not been able to figure out how to resolve this issue. They need to consult me. So to date, I have not found a scholarly answer to this dilemma. However, I believe there is a simple solution as we apply the biblical calendar. We're going to also include some Jewish tradition. Now, according to Leviticus chapter 23, verses 5 to 8, we know that Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread are to be observed on the following dates. So on the 14th of Nisan is the preparation for the Passover when the Passover lambs were to be killed. From the 15th to the 21st of Nisan, there is a seven-day feast with a rest day, like a Sabbath day on the first day and the seventh days, right? Now, they could be on any day of the week, right? But these are rest days or like Sabbath days. The 15th of Nisan was the first day of the feast, including the Passover meal, right? And the 15th is the first day, so it's always going to be a rest day, a Sabbath day. So the Passover is celebrated as the 14th day goes into the 15th day in the evening, and the 15th is the first day of Passover or of unleavened bread. As I mentioned previously, those terms are used synonymously many times. So is there a contradiction? Now, this supposed contradiction on the day that Yeshua was crucified has baffled me all my life until I came to Jerusalem. And that was first in the year 1995. I came here as an exchange, not exchange student, but as a, as a student, a semester abroad. I studied here in Jerusalem, and I was here in the spring, so I was able to celebrate Passover. So I just want to share with you a uh, short story to explain um, my um, epiphany or my revelation about um, this understanding of the Passover. So while I was a student here, I was invited to a home uh, of a Orthodox Jewish family to celebrate Passover in the old city of Jerusalem. And so on, um, on the, as the 14th day of Nisan was ending, right, and going into the 15th, that evening, maybe about 7 or 8 p.m., I went to this family's house. And um, we had a traditional Passover Seder, right? The traditional Passover meal and the ceremony around the table. And um, it was a beautiful time with this, um, this couple and their two sons who were about my age at the time. And I was there for about five or six hours until about 1 a.m. And as we were finishing up and had just this uh, wonderful evening together, um, I thanked them and was saying goodbye. And they said, well, we'll see you tomorrow night, right? And I said, well, um, sure, but why? I had no idea why they were asking. And they said, well, we have the second night of Passover. I had never heard of this before, but I went back the second night, and we did the same thing all over again. It was the same exact thing as the first night of Passover. I had never seen this before. I never heard of it until that time. I have since understood what this means. So there, is, there are two days of the first day of Passover, two celebrations of that Passover meal. Why are there two nights to celebrate the first night of Passover? So, the second day of Passover is called Yom Tov Sheni Shel Gliut, right? It's the second day, the, the second good day of the Pass of the Diaspora. Now, many of the Jewish traditions originated during the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BC. Uh, in Babylon, right? Now, the practice of the second night of Passover most likely began during that time, 605 to 539 BCE. 
So what is the reason for the second night of Passover? And this connects to the biblical calendar, right? It's all about discerning the phases of the moon. Now, the biblical calendar is based on the cycles of the moon, which are complex. They are not quite as easy to calculate as one may imagine. A new moon appears every 29 days, 12 hours, and 44 minutes. It's approximately 29 and a half days, but you don't count half days. You always have to have full days. So it's either uh, each new moon is either 29 or 30 days. And so it's going to be complicated figuring that out month to month. And furthermore, in describing the new moon, I read this on the NASA website. It, is, it explains this, quote, this is the invisible phase of the moon, with the illuminated side of the moon facing the sun and the night side facing earth. The, the moon becomes invisible when it's new because you don't see it, right? And so the picture on the screen illustrates this for us. And that's why the new moon is called the invisible phase, right? So because of the inconsistency of the new moon and the hiddenness of it, it had to be detected with the human eye month to month. However, this was very complicated 3,000 years ago, or even 2,000 years ago. So for the Jewish people, the beginning of a new month was based on the new moon as seen in Jerusalem. The Jewish council referred to as the Beit Din, in Jerusalem was, was responsible for declaring the new moon based on two eyewitnesses in Jerusalem. After the new moon was determined, messengers on horseback were dispatched, dispatched to inform the Jewish people in the land of Israel of the new moon, as we say, Rosh Chodesh, right, the new moon. So during the diaspora time, when the Jewish people were in Babylon, there was no way to determine the new moon in Jerusalem. Now, we don't know exactly when this practice began. However, at some point, the Jewish community began to observe two days for the first day of Passover, rather than just the biblically mandated one day of observance, to be certain that they were observing the right day of the festival, right? So they keep two days to make sure that they are uh, celebrating the right day according to the new moon. So this practice is not limited to Passover, but rather it is implemented for all of the appointed times, except for one, Yom Kippur, because it is a fast day, right? The Day of Atonement. So we don't want to fast more than we have to. So this practice of the second day of Passover and all the appointed times continues until today for Diaspora Jews not because of uncertainty regarding the new moon, but because of tradition, right? We know exactly how the moon phases work today with all of our technology. But because of tradition, what was started 2,600 years ago continues until today because of tradition. So, the Jewish tradition of two observations for the first day of Passover are the solution to the supposed contradiction in the Gospels. There is no contradiction. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all correct. There are two days for the first day of Passover. Matthew, Mark, and Luke focused on the first day of Passover when Yeshua ate the Passover meal with his disciples and instituted the new covenant, taking that matzah bread, that unleavened bread representing his body, and that third cup of wine after the meal, right, representing his blood. John focused on the second day of Passover when Yeshua literally became the Passover lamb for that second day of Passover. Matthew, Mark, and Luke referenced the preparation day for the first day of Passover, whereas John referenced the preparation day for the second day of Passover, which John calls a high Sabbath day. The mistake of many Bible translators in assuming is assuming that the preparation day is only for the weekly Sabbath, the seventh day, or what we call Saturday. There are also preparation days for appointed times like the Passover, which contains holy days or Sabbath days on the first and seventh days, which John clearly references in his gospel. So I just want to point out how John speaks of the, the preparation day, right? It says in John 19, 14, 
on the day that Yeshua was crucified. It says this, Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It, it, was, it was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king, right? So, and then in verse 31 we read, Then the Jews, uh, because it was the day of preparation, so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. All right, so here we see how the preparation day uh, equals the day um, before Passover, right? It's preparation for the Passover. John says that in verse 14. Although Yeshua was crucified on the first day of Passover, right, or on the first day of unleavened bread, it was also the preparation day for the second day of Passover, as recorded in John. And this is actually quite amazing because as the biblical calendar comes into play and Jewish tradition work, works it out in reality, we had this amazing um, opportunity or realization of how Yeshua um, illustrates this in his life, right? Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke focused on the first day of Passover when Yeshua instituted the new covenant as he shared the Passover with his disciples. And because there are two days of Passover, John focused on the second day of preparation for the Passover when Yeshua literally became the Passover lamb. If you have two days of Passover that you're celebrating, you have two days when lambs are sacrificed. And just to mention, not all of the Jews would celebrate the second day of Passover. It was all the Jews who came from outside and celebrated in Jerusalem. Those outsiders would celebrate that second day. But there was always going to be many people who celebrated that second day, just as there are today, as I illustrated um, in my first Passover here in Jerusalem in 1995. So through application of the biblical calendar and the practical outworking of the appointed times and the new moon, right, as evidenced in Jewish tradition, God's word makes perfect contextual sense with the two days of Passover, which is not a contradiction in the Bible, but is resolved. Now let's just, as we end this teaching, I want to answer a question that many people ask regarding the appointed times uh, or the biblical calendar, right? Should believers in Messiah still keep the appointed times of the Lord and follow the, the Hebrew calendar or the biblical calendar? And um, I would say the the easiest answer to that is simply this. Uh, I'll answer a question with a question. Um, as believers in Yeshua, do we, do we have to read the Bible? We don't have to, but it's a good idea if we want to get to know God and understand what He has written, right? And in this similar manner, um, you know, we don't have to keep the Sabbath day as God commanded it in the law. We don't have to keep the appointed times as written out in Leviticus 23. But if we under, want to understand the, the context and culture of the Bible, um, it's a good idea to practice them in some manner, um, you know, under in the New Covenant and in Messiah, um, so as to more fully understand this whole concept of the appointed times in God's biblical calendar. And as it says both in Romans chapter 14 and in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17, each of us needs to be convinced in our own mind regarding the Sabbath days, regarding the um, appointed times, and regarding the kosher laws, right? There's freedom, but we need to um, have our own conviction about that. So that's my answer to this question. It's a good idea, I think. Um, and I think it just gives us a better understanding of what's written in the Scriptures. Living in Israel now for uh, over 15 years and um, just walking through the biblical calendar, it's really given me a greater understanding of what's written in both the Old and New Testaments. So just in closing again, just to summarize the benefits of knowing and applying the biblical calendar, right? Number one, to understand the foundation of days and weeks, months, and years from God's perspective, right? God has given us a certain foundation, and we should, we should do our best to understand it. Number two, it's a reminder to stop and take weekly and yearly days to thank and worship God. The Sabbath day is a weekly reminder. The different appointed times on the calendar throughout the year remind us to stop and take time 
to thank God, worship Him, spend time with other believers. Number three, to read and study the Bible in context, right? As we understand the biblical calendar, we're able to read the Bible in context. We're able to apply a biblical and cultural perspective to the scriptures. The more we understand this foundational teaching of the biblical calendar. And finally, to understand God understand God's prophetic plan for Messiah, right? Just as we saw as the, as the uh, spring appointed times were fulfilled at Messiah's first coming through his death, burial, resurrection, and the giving of the Holy Spirit, we know that the, um, the second coming of Messiah will correlate with the fall appointed times. And um, we can understand that more as we celebrate those holidays as well. So that is the conclusion to part three of the biblical calendar teaching series. And this is the applying the biblical calendar teaching. And hopefully it is uh, logical, it makes sense, and helps you in your spiritual journey. Here are some of the resources I use uh, in my preparation for this teaching. And if you are uh, enjoying these teachings and benefiting, I want to encourage you to share them with a friend. And uh, if you're able to give a donation, whether small or great, we, we would be encouraged um, to know that you are benefiting and you're also enabling us to continue to make these teachings available. So thank you so much for partnering with us. God bless you and see you again next time.